All right. We are good to go. Thank you, by the way, for doing this. Oh, sure. Appreciate it. Any time that I get to spend with Iran, I, it's, it's great. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, do you know what happened four years ago this month? Um, yes. I turned 36. <laughs> right? What no, else? That, was, that was last month. That was, oh, last month. Oh, you mean November. Yep. I'm still That's back in October. This month. Right. Yeah. We released Rock Band 1 on what? November 20th, I think. That's right. So four long years since the release of the landmark game Rock Band. I don't remember anything from that. Nothing. It's all... We were all like passed out in a heap after we shipped the game. That's why we don't remember anything. That was so exhausting. <laughs> oh my god. What, so, so what was Harmonix like just before the release of Rock Band? Like as a company, what was the vibe like? We were pretty nervous actually. I remember us being kind of terrified because... You uh, mean right before the release? Yeah. The game... Like we had, so in other words, we had finished developing it and we were, it was now being manufactured and we're sitting there sort of wondering what's going to happen. Yeah, that was pretty terrifying. Yeah, because we, I mean, we had um, no idea whether consumers would be willing to spend $170 or whatever it was on a video game. Plus tax. Plus tax. And we had no idea, um, it was our first time manufacturing hardware. We didn't know if the millions of plastic instruments we had just made were actually going to work. Um, most of them did. <laughs> most of them. <laughs> Some of them didn't. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we had just finished a, this kind of marathon. We had been killing ourselves to ship this game for quite a long time. And then we were just, uh, we just didn't know if it was going to work. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of crossed fingers and anxiety as we were gearing up to release the game. And we were waiting for, e wait, waiting for the first reviews even. Right. Um, there was, I remember, uh, if you go back further, there was, um, there was that day that uh, we sort of realized that our future lay in, in, in rock band, basically. That's what was going to happen because we weren't developing Guitar Hero anymore. That was, you know, that was great and, and fun while it lasted, but we were moving on. And you know, here we are facing the fact that the entire company's future is resting with this one product. With this one really expensive video game. <laughs> yeah, really. And sort of big and complicated, you know, to the... This was complicated, right? Uh, I mean, Guitar Hero, by the time we got to Guitar Hero 2, yeah, you know, we added some more features and all that. We had done it for the Xbox 360, so that, you know, added some more complexity and stuff. But this thing was mammoth. I mean, We were shipping like a video game that had a USB hub in the box with it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's like, what were we thinking? It's like, it's completely crazy. Right, it's completely crazy. Um, so, oh, so we had, so Alex uh, pulls us all into this, this meeting, us all being the, kind of like the leads, right, of the, of the company. We had this meeting where we wanted to set everyone down and sort of say, look, this is what we're signing up for. Um, this is, you know, probably like a good year or year and a half before the release date. But basically, we, we were essentially anticipating that it was going to be a really hard year for us. It was going to be tough. We... We had huge challenges on all fronts, and we were basically asking people to sort of sacrifice and commit um, uh, to, to working long hours and thinking through hard problems and solving, you know, solving crazy situations. And uh, and every, you know, everyone stepped up. I remember people feeling like, kind of like one of those, mm -hmm. you know, moments like you're you're kind of gulping and. Uh, and, and you realize you have this sort of mission in front of you and it's been spelled out pretty clearly and you know it's going to suck, right? <laughs> you, know, you know it's going to be hard no matter how hard you plan and you're just kind of going there. And boy, pushing that thing out the door, I remember, I, still ha I think I still have that bug, you know, that on, on my wall for, I think I still have it there, was the bug graph for Rock Band, right? For the original Rock Band. And and sort of like two months before Gold Master, the bugs are rising, as they always do. But this is rising a lot. I mean, this thing is like just, you know, climbing and climbing and climbing. And, and you know, we're getting a little nervous about that. And, uh, 
And then, you know, we were working with EA, with Electronic Arts. They were starting to get nervous. They had never seen a game that had so many bugs so close to the ship date. And they basically said, you guys aren't going to make it. It's like, we've never seen anyone make it. And, and we said, you know what, I, I know this is tough, but I think we can do it. And they, they were nervous, and we just totally kicked ass on it. I mean, like, all of a sudden, one day, there was that point where the bug count started falling and falling and people were just on the motherfucker like you know it was just it was in, insane and people were working really hard and um, uh, and the and no one has seen it before you know e, like they were amazed at electronic arts when they came when they came by and they just and they saw that we shipped this game I mean, we, we did it we made Christmas we made you know we made our dates uh, it was brutal but we did it so, Aran, were you more in the thick of the actual development process uh, in Rock Band than Alex, who is probably a little more focused on the business side of the project? I mean, we were all pretty involved in a lot of what was going on because there were so many things flying around. I, yeah, I was more paying attention to actual development issues. Um, you know, which coders are working on what, how, um, you know, what are our features look like, what do we cut, what do we keep. Um, I don't know, what do you remember from, from back then? Well, I mean, that summer, in the months leading up to the ship, I mean, one of the big moments for Rock Band was the unveiling of the game on stage at E3 with Peter Moore, who ended up getting a maneuver named after himself. <laughs> oh, that's when, right, the Peter when Moore. When he paused the game with his hand accidentally in the middle of the unveiling of Rock Band. Yeah, but nice. It all worked out okay. It man. worked out. I know. Well, you, and the who? Well, that was the subsequent summer. Oh, that was the subsequent summer. That's true. That was also pretty big, though. Yeah, well, that was, I mean, that was one of the great highlights of the last several years, you know, getting the who to play our E3 party. I mean, that was pretty surreal. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, so when you were working in the MIT Media Lab, could you have ever envisioned your own event headlined by the who? Oh, totally. I mean, at the Media Lab, we were basically thinking, hey, you know what, we should start a company so we can host an event with the who, <laughs> right? I mean, like, that's, that was kind of our ultimate goal in life. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, good answer. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. Um, Alex, is it true that you're you're more of an optimist than uh, Mr. Agozi in, when it comes to uh, things like maybe the launch of Rock Band? Um, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I think Iran and I. One of the, one of the many reasons that we work really well together is that we're kind of yin and yang to each other. I'm a little bit more of the like starry-eyed optimist and Iran is always the one throwing cold water on things and it's probably <laughs> it's probably really good for the company that we have both of those forces at work because either one of them out of control doesn't get you anywhere good I guess that's true I, I, I tend to be very optimistic about uh, our kind of our abilities as a company you know I think that we can just achieve a ton um, but then what ends up happening is that you realize the realities of the marketplace and you know, I wouldn't have predicted Rock Band doing what it did. You know, it was it was nuts. Well, the, the, I mean, like, Guitar Hero, who would have predicted that, right? So we just, you know, people might have heard the story already, but after we shipped Guitar Hero, we had, we had no idea what would happen. We knew we made a good game. We had made lots of good games. Um, Alex stood in front of the company and said, hey, guys, I know we're really proud of this game. We... we will have just made 70,000 people really happy. <laughs> but, you, you know, it's time to move on from that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily something we're going to keep working on if, you know, we have other things to do. So that was, right, that was, on, that was kind of as we were gearing up for the Guitar Hero launch. And then everything changed, right? So it became this phenomenal, well, it's the huge thing that it is. And then kind of doing it again two years later with, with Rock Band, kind of, kind of crazy. Yeah. Can Can you remember your initial reaction? Even though it's sort of a logical extension of of what we did with Guitar Hero, can you mem remember your first reaction to the first pitch of Rock Band that you heard? Or who? I don't even know. I don't even know who first pitched it to you. Well, there wasn't really a first pitch of Rock Band. I mean, the vision for Rock Band, in some sense, almost predated Guitar Hero. Actually, like, like even when we were first crafting Guitar Hero, um, 
in the, in the original inception of Guitar Hero, we were thinking in our minds of what it would eventually become as a full band experience. And so, you know, in s some sense, Guitar Hero was a step towards, like, there was a pitch for the, that vision that, pre you know, predated the work we were doing on Guitar Hero. There were, but, but there was so, still some um, sort of tricky things to figure out. Like, the notion of putting the entire band in a box was kind of kind of nutty and in fact I remember our initial meetings um, when we're discussing this stuff we thought that was crazy like you know that that couldn't work even even though Guitar Hero proved to work would you be able to pack all that stuff into one box so we, we initially actually thought no and we thought we would we came up with this whole hairbraid scheme of like first maybe doing some drums by themselves and having to interoperate with a guitar and then you'd, you'd get a microphone too and maybe two guitars could work at once and, and all this stuff and then at some point we realized look the consumer is that's too complicated the consumer is just going to want to buy the full experience and you know the great thing about that was uh, you know it was a huge leap of faith but it enabled all these wonderful things to happen right I think you bought the band in a box you took it apart I mean, just just taking just remember those that day when you opened it up and there was just so much stuff in there and you know you're like, you know this and the batteries go in there and the USB hub goes there and it's just a big complicated setup, right? You finally set it up, and you can get the whole family to play, and you know that I don't think that would have happened. It, there's just such an exciting moment. I don't think it would have happened if it was like piecemeal. There was something about having to put the whole thing together. It's the it's the full experience. And that brings me to um, this uh, question. Um, you basically had to create an entire manufacturing organization to enable all these instruments to exist and the packaging and all that. Um, I wonder if you could talk about what, what that was like, the challenges in doing it, and how or why you chose Daniel Sussman to lead that charge. Why did we give something so important to Daniel? <laughs> That's a fine question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we knew it was going to be punishing, and he's a punk rocker, so he can take anything. That's right. He, he totally did. That was amazing. That was yeah. amazing. That, so I don't know if people have an appreciation for this or if they've seen some of the videos of what the operation looked like, but it was, also, it was completely crazy. Um, we, still don't, we still can't believe that we pulled it off. And you talk to Daniel, and he'll tell you that at any moment in time, we were sort of like this close to catastrophic failure. And somehow... Just you know, we just kind of always saved it from the nosedive and pulled back up again, and all these God, all these different issues came up because we'd never. First of all, we'd never done it. Um, in China, they weren't used to doing things on. I mean, they do things on a large scale there, but our time frame was really compressed, and and no one there was used to working on such such a crazy timeline. At the same time, everyone was completely psyched, right? Because they all understood that they were making making something completely amazing. Um, and, and so all the, you know, all the factory workers and all the people managing them, there were like four factories at the same time. There were you know, different, just organizing the logistics of who's making what and how the product is flowing from one warehouse to the other and when does it get at the, at the shipping yard. And at one point we had, at peak production, we had 10,000 factory workers simultaneously making rock band instruments. Right, it's insane. Which is, yeah, which is more than all of Viacom's employees, <laughs> right? Probably by twice as much or something. So, so yeah, so it was co totally crazy. In fact, um, the reason you've seen this huge boom in the Chinese economy is because of us. <laughs> <laughs> so you've ruined America, is what you're saying? Basically, <laughs> rock band ruined America. Yeah, but good job. <laughs> Did either of you ever get to take a trip to those factories? Uh, I did once, yes, although, you know, Daniel practically lived there for a year. And there were others on the hardware team who spent, you know, Matt Bach and others who spent quite a lot of time over there. Mm -hmm. What, like, it's, it's, it's one thing to be over here and to understand you have all these uh, objects in motion, but then when you actually go and see it, what, what was that like for you? Well, the scale is kind of dumbfounding. When you first walk into a giant warehouse and you see this mountainous stack or stacks, row after row after row of boxes full of, you know, rock band bundles, it's kind of a you know jaw-dropping moment where you you know you really don't appreciate the scale until you see it all in one place at one time. But at the same time, it was also kind of staggering to me to see how um, 
small scale the individual production lines were. It's just that they were running all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So there would be a line with, you know, you'd go into a room where guitars were being made, and it was a room that was, you know, it was modest size, like a cafeteria-sized room with maybe 20 workers on multiple lines working. And, you you th you know, you have to ask yourself, how does this turn into hundreds of thousands of guitars? And it's just that that team is, you know, they rotate in in three shifts, and it was basically running 24 hours a day for, you know, for, for months to produce all that hardware. We were, we were running at 100,000 a week, I think. Every week, those plants were... Right? Yeah, well, during peak production, it b ballooned up to just dozens of lines, and it was insane. Yeah. Um, so, Harmonix uh, was making Rock Band. It was a big decision to make this huge, monstrous thing. Were there any other projects on the table that you could have done instead of Rock Band? I don't think so. I mean, once, uh, you know, after Guitar Hero, uh, it was pretty clear what we needed to do next. As I said, I mean, the, the, the grand vision for Rock Band, on, in some sense, predated Guitar Hero. So it was, you know, it was, I don't remember us ever really considering anything else beyond, no. beyond no. Guitar Hero. Well, that, it, that's what was so exciting and so scary at the same time, is you realize that you're kind of putting the, the, the future of the entire company resting on this one, one thing, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's not a very diversified approach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, hey, it was a big bet you know, big gamble and, and made a big difference. Can you, can you believe that four years later people are still playing the rock band games? And that, and that we're still supporting it every single week with... Well, yeah, it's been, content. what, 200, <laughs> we, over 200 weeks now that we've been releasing DLC every yeah, week. Yeah, and we see the numbers. I mean, every week we see how many people play and how many people are buying DLC and it's, it's amazing. Right, because, right, it's sort of not in the news anymore and it's, it's not you know, in the public eye, but, you know, people are still enjoying the experience. It's still, it's still amazing. And it's because at the end of the day, right, it's about the music. And, and it's about experiencing music that you know and love in a new and deeper way. And that's kind of, you know, once, once you have that, I don't, I don't think it gets old. You know, it's not like a game where you've beat the game and, okay, so you might play it again to, to get some more achievements and, okay, now you're done. Right here, Every week you get you, you get to experience more songs. Oh, yeah, which which is great. But it's you know it's because it's music, right? Like no one says, "My God, can you believe people are still listening to music on their iPod?" <laughs> right? Like how many years has it been? But it's but it's a little bit like that, right? It's you know so shift your frame of reference a little bit, and then it makes more sense. But you know but the the DLC thing, uh, we should also mention like in, in case anyone cares. You know, we, we, we were very explicit from the very beginning that this was going to be a platform to let you experience all kinds of rock music, right? Um, I mean, there was a huge fiery debates about what the disc songs should be, you know, those initial 40, 45 songs on disc, right? Is that what it was? Is this 45? Is it 45? I think it's 45. Okay, so for Rock Band 1. Um, but we always knew that we had downloadable songs. And the thing just exploded. You know, we were, it, you know, it's, I guess it seems obvious now maybe, but back then th there was no large scale DLC business for games. You know, you'd buy a map pack and there were some successful ones too for certain games. But this was, this completely you know, blew the numbers off of anything that anyone had ever seen. Well, there, there, this whole notion of a software platform on the consoles also didn't exist. This idea that you could buy DLC for one title and then have it work with future right. titles, this drove the first parties, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, crazy because they had their consoles won't, weren't really set up to accommodate that. So, so they so had we, to do a lot of work to help accommodate the strange things we were trying to do. With the we platform. asked them to do a lot of stuff to accommodate this this beast. You know, and and they did. Mm -hmm. It was you know it was it was great. But right, we, we were carving a lot of new new paths, you know, uh, for you know for how this whole system works. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm you know I'm really psyched about the fact that you know over three thousand songs, over a hundred million songs downloaded. You know, it's these are amazing statistics. Um, but we were planning on that from day one. You know, this thing, these things don't happen kind of by accident. We really we really wanted to to make sure that this was um, this was a platform. This was kind of 
almost like a device that you could use to experience lots and lots of different songs, just like you can, you know, your your iPod. Cool. So a lot of you already mentioned the Who thing, but a lot of crazy things have happened in the course of the franchise's life. I wonder if you have any favorite memories, favorite stories, anything crazy that you can recall. Well, the the Who playing our party at E3 in 2008 was was a highlight. I mean, I remember turning to one of our cohorts, Paul at MTV, during that Who show and asking him, "Is this actually happening?" You know, just because it was so surreal. Um, the whole Beatles experience was just mind blowing from beginning to end. I mean, actually getting to creatively mm -hmm. collaborate with Ringo and Paul and Yoko and Olivia and Danny on that project was just, again, it was hard to believe it was actually happening. You know, and then when they actually showed up on stage at E3 to, right. you know, I was like literally got goosebumps as that was all happening. Still hasn't, I don't think that moment has been topped at an E3 press event ever. Yeah, that was yeah, pretty amazing. That was pretty cool. They hadn't all been together on stage like that in years, right? Yeah, I can't remember. I mean, we the sort last of time. it's it's almost like we got the Beatles back together again yeah, for yeah. like you know for like a little bit. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of. Do you have a favorite memory? This is kind of a, a bit of a tangent, but you know, there's the there's the thing that happened two summers ago where the boat, the harmonics boat trip. <laughs> Tell us about that. You know, so we decided to do this contest uh, to uh, to have everyone in the company go up on stage, everyone who wanted to, form into little groups and sing a cappella songs. Because we were introducing harmony singing in the Beatles game. Exactly. Uh, they had to pick a song that was in the rock band catalog. Initially, we thought maybe just the Beatles, but we expanded it a bit. So um, it had to be a rock band song. You got together with coworkers into groups of like three, four, five. Um, you had to get up on stage in front of the entire company, which, mind you, at that point was nearing 300 people, um, and you had to sing. <laughs> and people did amazing stuff. It was it was this like huge um, creative uh, flow of energy, you know, from the company, and it, it was really wonderful. Well, I don't remember how many groups we had. We probably had 20, 30. So it's like 20 groups. Yeah, 20 like groups, and uh, uh, and then. We were going to select the winners to go with me and Alex on a boat cruise. Um, and what we ended up doing was picking everyone. So every group who, who had the balls to go on stage and, and sing in front of the company uh, got to go on the boat. Uh, we did declare winners who got to, go on the, got, got to go on the boat in limos. Remember that? Yeah, the limos didn't go on the boat, but the limos did convey them to the no, boat. No, there was this loading dock, don't you remember, where the limo like drove up onto the boat. I don't remember that part. Next to the helipad. <laughs> I don't remember the helicopter. Okay, right. I'm making that up. Right. <laughs> uh, it was the most fun party we had ever had on the water. Um, it was the most fun party we had ever had on a boat. Yeah. Even if you take out the boat, it was the most <laughs> fun party we ever had. Anyways, it was totally great. But I sort of think of it as, as a rock band thing, right? Because it sort of... If it wasn't for rock band, this wouldn't have happened. That was kind of one of the inspirations, you know. Like Alex said, harmony, harmony singing, which we introduced in in Beatles rock band, was was part of the deal. How many patents have we created since since the birth of rock band? <coughs> oh, since the birth of rock band. Uh, well, the, the, there's like filing patents, and there's actually getting them. Usually, you get the patent years and years after you file them. So we're actually right now starting to get some of the patents that we had filed four years ago, you know, when we were coming up with Rock Band. But um, if you look at Harmonix's history, uh, we've, we're probably in the order of like 45, 50 patents that were kind of somewhere along the way in, on the stage from starting to having been approved. Can you think of anything during the development of any of these rock, rock Band games where things might have gone a little awry and uh, maybe led to, even, just, even if just for a moment, led to, to some doubt? Well, I mean, there's always doubt about our ability to pull it off, you know, because as Iran already said, like we felt like we were inches away from catastrophe basically constantly for a year while we were trying to get the thing done and get all the instruments manufactured. 
I don't think we ever really had a moment of, a moment of doubt that we were doing the right thing. I mean, this was, this was, it felt from the beginning that this was the game that we were born to make as a company. So, you know, that kept us going through the whole, through all of that I, know, I stress. Honest, I think the toughest time was, was just the hardware. It was the thing we had least experience with. We understood software and how to make games. You know, we'd make we made a ton of games before. We kind of knew we knew that space. We had an intuition of what to do and what not to do. But with hardware, man, it was just it was so scary. And there's so much money at stake, right? With with uh, with manufacturing all this stuff. Um, and you know, in our very first run, I remember we had. You know, we had some problems with some of the guitars. You know, not all of them, but even if it's tiny, even if you have just like a, a really small percentage of the problem, it could still be a lot of units. You know, so then we're, you know, working on fixing them and and figuring and sending orders to China about what you know what we found out and how to how to fix the problems and all that. And and mind you, this is something that I think happens all the time for all kinds of hardware. You know, like um, it's just that we this was the first time we were experiencing it. So and we had no time. It was the time and frame we had no time, insanely right, compressed. Because this had to ship with the software. So I, that, I think that cost the most sleepless nights. Just having this, this kind of like, oh, there's this thing out in China. There's a ton of money pouring into <laughs> China. You know, we're getting stuff back. And God, I hope it's good because if it's not, we are effed, <laughs> you know. And it worked out. I mean, we had some problems, but we managed to... You know, every problem we tackled, and you know, we overcame every single, every single issue. Um, and you know, our number one goal the whole time was to make sure that the customer had like a good experience. You know, so if we suspected there was a problem, we did things like extend the warranty period, and you know, we did a number of things just to make sure that people like who, you know, who bought into the concept, right? Who sort of trusted us to give them a great experience. By you know by plunking down quite a lot of money for this, we wanted to make sure that they felt happy and, and satisfied, and and with that goal, you know, in our minds, we just kind of that's how we made our decisions. Um, one of the things that I think is an important defining aspect of the Rock Band franchise was the ongoing competition with our friends at Activision. But I know. Um, was there a part of you that enjoyed that competition, that healthy competition with Activision and Guitar Hero? No. Not really. It was pretty rough. <laughs> it, was, it was tough. Actually, I mean, look, on some level, you know, comp the competition pushes you to do the very best work you possibly can. Um, but, you know, you take, for example, the challenges of inventory management. Even without intense competition, you know, you're 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 manufacturing a very expensive product with very thin margins, and so getting the volume right is key. Um, you ship too li light, and you un you know you under you, you produce in an adequate inventory for demand, and you have a lot of unhappy consumers. If you ship too much, you lose a lot of money, and you need to make decisions about that six months in advance when you commit to manufacturing volumes. And so, inventory management is a really difficult aspect of this business. You add into that a competitor. And it makes it vastly more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the two uh, the two parties ended up. You know, yet they have to end up bidding to acquire uh, the same music that drives oh, up the right. cost of music, which makes it uh, more difficult to make the business profitable. The two parties are uh, bidding for retail space for these very big boxes that makes the cost of retail presence uh, much higher. So all of these these competitive factors basically just made it much much harder for either party to run a profitable business. And at the end of the day, I mean, generally, I think competition serves the consumer's interests. But when the competition gets so severe that uh, it's hard for anyone who's competing to actually run a, a healthy, profitable business, in the end, that actually doesn't serve the interests of the, of the consumer. Yep. So that was pretty rough. That was rough. It was, yeah, it was just, you know, we were so... We were so much in the same space. We were so close. I mean, there's sure there's competition everywhere, and it's one of those things you have to deal with. In fact, for the long for the longest time, we didn't have to. Competition didn't matter to us. We didn't have to deal with it, mostly because the space was so tiny. We were the only ones in it. You know, so life was easier back when we had no competitors. We also had no customers. We also had no customers. <laughs> so you know, it's <laughs> kind of a, you know, it's a two sides of the same. The same coin, I guess. At what point in the in the 
process of creating Rock Band, did you realize that they were doing a full band game too? I think we took that for granted, actually. Yeah, we just assumed that Guitar Hero 4 was going to be a full band game. They really they had no choice at that point because Rock Band had been a huge success, and I think if they didn't adapt in that way, they would have very quickly become obsolete. Mm -hmm. I just think, so I did, I met with Bobby very briefly, you know, shortly after Harmonix became independent again, uh, you know, early this year. And um, there was no real objective other than to open a channel of communication and, and, and thaw the, you know, chill in communication that mm -hmm. had set in during the years of the rock band Guitar Hero Wars, you know. I just love the picture of that scene, because it, it, it's so, it's so dramatic, and like, and I'm sure it wasn't dramatic, but it's so dramatic to think of like, this whole lead up and then these two like generals <laughs> no yeah, there, was, there was no real drama it but you know but there, there was you know there was a really interesting kind of to see how it how it went down right because we started off it was us and red octane you know and those guys were great you know we we both were two tiny little companies uh that had you know had done some interesting stuff here and there but you know nothing nearly this huge and we kind of hunkered down we kind of went in together we both risked a, a, a lot, you know, they risked a ton of, a ton of uh, their own money. You know, we, um, we were kind of putting all, all in to, to, this, to this product, you know, thinking that it might not do anything at all. But, um, you know, and then it kind of started exploding. And I remember that first year after Guitar Hero 1, you know, but before we both started getting bought by big companies, you know, it was really cool. And it was a little sad you know, to kind of have that be, be kind of separated. Yeah, in fact, there was a very real possibility that actually Harmonix and Red Octane would have uh, stayed independent and partnered or even ended up merging. There was a possibility that we would have joined forces and actually become one company, and then things may have evolved very, very differently over right. the next five years. If but it just, place. yeah, but in, in 2006, things just happened so fast. You know, you, you, all of a sudden we hear that, there's rumors that maybe they're talking to Activision then, poof, in April, right? April, I think, in 2006, they get bought by Activision. And then, you know, a few months later, we announced that we're getting bought by MTV. And, um, yeah, it's almost like, you know, they, they tore us apart. And, uh, I mean, in some sense, we kind of did it to ourselves, right? But, but I, think we, I think we still both felt a little bit of um, sort of, you know, a little bit of... Um, so kind of you know separation pains from from that. Didn't didn't Bobby say his big regret was when he did make that acquisition? He did not acquire Harmonix along with it. He gave a dice talk about a year mm -hmm. and a half ago where he he made that point that you know one of his mistakes was I mean he gave Harmonix as an example. There were others that he mentioned like Maxis, but cases where he had kind of bought the wrong thing. I mean I think in that case it had um, Harmonix and Red Octane stayed together and. Uh, been unified. I think it would have been much easier um, for the business to be profitable for you know and, and healthy for for us and for them. The um, the flip side is that you know the arms race between the two franchises really did push us to pour everything we had into advancing the genre over the next couple of years. I mean we killed ourselves for years trying to keep pushing the ball forward and stay ahead of the yeah. competition and at the end of the day we probably made it farther faster than we would have you know had we um, had that you know war not started yeah that's true but yeah you know in some sense I kind of wish we had managed to stay together I think that would have been sort of would have been a um, kind of a more friendly kind of outcome because you know we did we were partners on this thing and we had our specialty they had their specialty and we worked great together we, worked great together. we really liked those guys yeah. and so but you know life goes on <laughs> yeah can you think of any ways that Iran has changed since the success of Rock Band? He has better haircuts now. <laughs> no more he has higher quality jeans that fit him properly now. But as a person, no. I, I don't think he's changed at all. Ron, the same question to you about Alex. Sorry, repeat the question? <laughs> how, is it, how have you seen Alex change since uh, Rock Band's launch and success? Since Rock Band's launch? Um, well... I think he's lost some hairs. That has happened. That has happened. Um, look, we're fundamentally the same people. The, the thing that's been interesting to witness about Alex is that um, 
kind of, and it's not necessarily just from Rock Band on, you know, but from around that time period, like his his business instincts, his ability to run a company of this size, his ability to sort of maneuver through, uh, you know, this crazy landscape of um, uh, of of like publishers and first party and competitors and. Uh, licensors and the music industry and it's it's all really big and complicated and this guy totally has it down it's kind of amazing and he didn't like go to school you know to, to figure it out right it was all you know like basically being like smart uh, having good instincts and like learning a ton on the job and kind of you know learning from his mistakes so at this point this dude is like a formidable CEO that I, you know, you ought to be scared if you are negotiating next to this guy, right? It's like against this guy. It's a, uh, yeah, you're you're probably you're probably gonna lose until I screw it all up. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. So it so really impressive, you know. Just um, it's been really fun to see um, to see this because like, you know, we started off like right straight out of grad school. We knew nothing. We were right? kids. We were just like, like bupkis, right? Mm. We didn't know anything. About, we thought we did, mm. right? But we actually didn't know anything. And it's been kind of cool to see how, you know, how we've, like both, you know, both of us have developed over the over the past 16 years. Uh, is there a band or a genre of music that you've gained an appreciation for via our game that you otherwise can't imagine you would have? Like a Ron, you're not much of a metalhead. I'm not much of a metalhead, but I, I'm sort of into the, the the hard rock kind of heavy grooving stuff, you know. It's, it's great for rock band, actually. It plays really well. Well, right, exactly. So, yes, I'm a classical music guy, but, you know, we can rock out. <laughs> we can rock out in Dorian mode. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just say that? Yeah. Yep, on camera. Oh, shit. <laughs> Alex, any particular band or genre that you've expanded your horizons into? Not really. I mean, most of the stuff I like ends up on the platform just because, you know, I make Eric Brocious put it there. <laughs> but in terms of new stuff, I mean, I will say that every single rock band disc soundtrack had just a few hidden gems on it for me, some bands that, you know, I'd like never heard of or songs that I didn't know that I ended up you know, falling in love with over the course of playing the game. I don't think I don't think I had played OK Go before before Rock Band. That was one of those. I, th I it's a pretty awesome band, and I think that in particular I remember. That was kind of one of the the big bands that came out of Rock Band for a lot of people. Uh huh. OK Go. Yeah. Well, that was one of the ones that I made Eric put in the first. Oh game. really? Yeah. Well, good job. Yeah. Well, because I saw I mean you saw their their music video for their for the first single. Uh huh. Um, so it was you know it was super catchy tune that yeah. got stuck in my ear. Yeah, so so those guys were cool. I'm psyched we got Lady Gaga in the game, right, as DLC. As well as the Eric Cartman cover of Right, that was Lady an Gaga. amazing moment, right? We like, I think it was that the same week that they were released? Uh, or one week apart or something? Yeah, they were released together. But right, yeah. Like we get Poker Face by Lady Gaga and then Poker Face by Cartman doing Lady Gaga <laughs> like one week apart. Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, t talking about highlights of the rock band and Guitar Hero years, like turning on an, I'm a huge South Park fan, and turning on an episode of South Park and seeing rock band prominently featured, that was a right. highlight for that me. That was, I, I totally agree. And that, that was actually. Yeah, th then we know we made it to the big leagues because we were in South Park. <laughs> that was actually the, the origin of the Cartman poker face, uh, you know, because when I saw that, my first reaction was like to call MTV and be like, guys, we got to get the Gartman version of Poker Face into the game, and like MTV, those guys were awesome. They scrambled and started talking to the South Park Studios people, and then it showed up, uh, you know, a couple months later. That was one of the great aspects of being part of MTV is shit like that. You could just happen. pick up the phone and say, "I want, <laughs> I want Cartman doing one of our songs." <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so let's close it out. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to the fans who have kept this going for four years and buy our content every week and? are still heavily invested in what we do from day to day. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, thanks, guys. It's like, you know, it's, it sounds cheesy, but, right, we couldn't have done it without you. It's, no, which and is it's totally true. Is the reason we do it. I mean, the best part of this job is going out into the world and seeing people playing the game and just, like, rocking out and singing their guts out and just having this amazing emotional experience with the game. And so even when things get incredibly stressful and difficult here, 
like just going out into the world and seeing people playing the game just recharges you creatively and sort of gives you new fuel to, to go back in and keep doing it. So thanks, everybody. And I love the stories. You know, people have, people say, you know this, you read all, all of them, right? But we, we get just these amazing stories. And it's the really, wedding proposals. The wedding proposals, right? The, you know, the, um, I always wanted to play but never quite did and, uh, and all of a sudden now I'm, I'm playing a real instrument. I've become a drummer because of the game. I know, just, just you know, like, um, I don't know, seeing rock band used in music therapy where you have, you know, like, victims of, like, either horrible accidents or, or whatnot, and they're kind of recovering, and they're, they're using this stuff to, to get their kind of muscles moving again, you know. Like, there's some really gratifying stuff, you know. Yes, it's just a game, but it also touches people really deeply, and it's, uh, it's pretty wonderful. Fish, any last last minute questions I might have missed? What was it like being in Time Magazine? Just curious. Oh, yeah. the the two thousand This was the two thousand eight. Uh, Time one hundred. Yeah, the Time one hundred, right? Yeah. Uh, so so it was us there, and also uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He was there, also. <laughs> uh, who? <laughs> Who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Although, I, I think he's gotten more famous since then. Right. We haven't been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that, yeah, that, I guess that was another one of those like pinch me kind of moments. Because, yeah, that's, it's kind of a big deal. And I, you know, I think our images of ourselves are still very modest. I mean, we're just a couple of guys. You know, we... We still remember what that that we were trying to start this company on a shoestring, you, you know, like hanging out in grad school together, you know, eating ramen noodles, you know, all that stuff is. I still think of myself as the same guy, you know. So all of a sudden, being put in the situation seem is a little surreal, and it's like, you know, cool things. It still you seems know. like this isn't actually happening. Yeah, but but at this at the end of the day, it's still, um, you know, it's still a ton of fun. Right. That's why we come into work every day because we like what we do, and t you know, Time Magazine or not, that doesn't really matter. It's it's just about you know coming in and trying to like ha you know have a good time doing stuff that you believe in. You know that that matters. And seeing people playing playing it, you know, makes it all worthwhile. <laughs>